Welcome back to the um, conference. Hope you had a good coffee break. All right, now we're going to move on to our first panel discussion for this morning, and the title would be Aligning Organizational KPIs with Customer Experience Strategy. I'd like to invite the moderator, Mr. Vinod Mutukrishnan, the Chief Executive Officer of Cloud Cherry. Please welcome. All right, um, first panelist is Mr. Vipu Chawla, the Managing Director, APAC for Pizza Hut. Welcome. All right, um, next it's uh, Mr. Raju Naye, Managing Director, Head of Customer Journey Experience at DBS Bank. Welcome. And I also have Mr. Alvin Tan, Chief Customer Solutions Officer at Ascenda Singh Group. And then Al, Mr. Alp Alton, Executive General Manager, Transformation and Customer Operations, Asia at IHE. Welcome. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you have any questions, please pose your questions into Slido, um, and then the panelists will pick on the questions as and when they move on. All right, enjoy the panel. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it is always my privilege to host panels with people as great as this. So. I was told what's the best thing I could do with a panel like this. I was told just get out of the way. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm going to do, ask questions and get out of the way. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking through this panel. This is not a panel we uh, walked up and we are deciding what to tell you. Uh, we aligned thoughts. It was very important for us to make sure that the 39 minutes that we have are valuable to everyone. Uh, and they've spent a lot of time making sure that we distill the most basic truths uh, out for everybody out here. So thank you again for the time spending, uh, you know, spent in uh, educating me on how you built your CX uh, programs. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, in no particular order, just for you to introduce yourself um, and very importantly share the uh, the CX philosophy that guides everything else that you do. So maybe we'll start with Alp. All right. Um, my name is Alp Alton. I'm working with uh, Insurance Australia Group. We have uh, presence in six countries in in Asia and are the largest insurance provider in um, Australia. Um, our mantra is um, customer-led and data-driven. So you need the, the guiding principle to be about the customer, bring the best service that you can to the customer, and it has to be data-driven um, to avoid hero behavior. I won't talk about that a little bit later. Uh, my name is Alvin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ascender Singbridge is a business space developer. We have just uh, expanded to 11 countries uh, outside Asia. We grew to uh, US and uh, UK now. Um, with us, while we are <coughs> a business space developer, the company runs on the vision of creating a sustainable urban development that catalyzes economic transformation and enriches lives. And given that, heavy government-sounding vision, the way we deal with not just the B2B customers, we also have to work you know, well with the users. So the whole customer experience philosophy in Ascender Singbridge runs around four letters, HOST, H-O-S-T, which means hassle-free, operational excellence, serve with a passion, and trustworthiness. Super helpful, thank you. Raju. Hi, I'm uh, Raju, I'm with uh, DBS. Uh, I run customer experience for the consumer and wealth, and uh, we are across six markets, as many of you would know. We Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, India, China. These are where we play mostly. And uh, for us, from a CX perspective, so I think aspirationally, what we are trying to uh, see, and you must be seeing it uh, presented in our present ad campaigns, we are just trying to see how we can make our customers live more and bank less. Right? So I think that is the aspirational uh, guide. Uh, at execution level, it is uh, how do we make all the journeys they go through with us and the experience really respectful, easy to deal with, and dependable. So I think um, as we execute well, uh, we hope to reach our aspiration. Hear me? Good morning. My name is Vipul and I work for Yum Brands. Uh, Yum Brands has three global iconic uh, brands in its fold, KFC, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, each of which are market leaders in the categories in which they operate. We have 47,000 restaurants in the world and we open 2,000 restaurants a year. 
which means we open one restaurant every four to six hours somewhere in the world, which makes us, we think, the largest retail developer in the world. A large part of that business is in Asia, uh, and I manage one of those brands in Asia, which is uh, Pizza Hut, which I very proudly wear. Uh, our philosophy in our company is that because we have a lot of employees, uh, about one and a half million employees in the total business, and these employees are the last touch point and last mile for the customer experience, my primary job is to take care of our people, our people take care of our customers, profits take care of themselves. And the operating customer philosophy is that the customer experience will never exceed that of the team member experience. And a lot of stuff that we do is around that. We, of course, have metrics and other things which I know we'll talk about today. And, and so I'm delighted to be here. We know thank you for organizing this panel. Awesome. Absolutely. So as we move to the, the question that's on top of your minds, how do these business leaders quantify the ROFCX? Uh, we're going to share the entire journey, how they built uh, that ultimate outcome, and it's a, it's a bit of a journey. Uh, so I actually want to start uh, with you, Vipul, because uh, uh, what I want to truly understand is how did the CX function get built, um, and how did you get buy-in, organizational buy-in and alignment around that? And I know you did something very interesting. So just for, the, for those of you who don't know, uh, the chief customer experience officer at uh, Yum is Troy, who is a fairly famous figure in CX. Uh, in, in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Uh, but before Troy came on board, uh, Vipul did some very interesting things, and I'd want for all of you to kind of learn what is it that Vipul did. Thank you. So I would say we are building the customer function because in our business, the operations team, which is the chief operating officer, uh, which was a role we had before Troy joined, ran the restaurants for us. But it was clear to us that what got us here won't get us there. And we had to evolve the manner and tone in which we were engaging with customers. So we decided to go outside our industry. And we were really delighted that uh, somebody like Troy was able to get interested and join our business. But before we even wrote the job description, I decided to test drive that role by double hatting. So I, I, I did my current role as the, running the region and ran the customer function for about six months uh, as the chief customer officer to get a feel of what does this role really entail. Now the good news is that the company discovered that I was an absolutely terrible chief customer officer and clearly we had to go outside. Uh, which was great. But it gave me a sense of uh, what the challenges might be, what we might be looking for. Because we were not exactly certain that just writing a JD would be sufficient. So, and I know we'll talk a little more about le that later today. Awesome. Raju, would you want to share your team composition, how you built it? Uh, team composition, so customer, so in, in banking, we always had uh, customer service, customer experience uh, teams. But over the years, and for DBS, and some of you have probably heard me on this for a couple of years now, so we have in the last eight years actually built up this whole custom CX as a practice. Right? So from, from a perspective of that, it is not uh, CX. The big shift is CX is not about just customer service. CX is um, actually how you run your business, how you think about your business model, how you think about executing your strategy. Uh, so that thinking from top down uh, is how we built, uh, we had to create an executive buy-in for that. And, uh, and a lot of us know our CEO is quite famous in the region uh, for uh, being the face of it. And uh, his uh, presence and his uh, insistence on keeping it at the top of the house uh, agenda was key over the last eight years. So using that, what we have also done, and it's, it's a team. So our team from just being customer service professionals, now we have people who are data-led um, analysts uh, in looking at customer voice across. We have ethnographers. We have uh, researchers. And we have replicated, and I have replicated the team in all my countries now. So I, I have in the consumer businesses, in all these markets, teams. And we are slowly, progressively changing the skill sets of people. Uh, in the bank towards a CS practice. We have now a very strong, though not in my team, but with separately a full design uh, and uh, UX practice, which has also grown from strength to strength uh, over this period. So a lot of things, uh, So because CX is not my department alone. CE is not my department alone. So as, as you would say, it is everything. And we are slowly seeing how we embed that thinking into different functions uh, across different parts of uh, DBS. So we say uh, making banking joyful. My compliance head says how to make compliance joyful. So you know, so that is how we think uh, around uh, what all is necessary to really get to the aspiration. 
Alvin, I know you also run a fairly extensive uh, CX team and, and practice. Would you like to share that with us? Maybe let, let me just share, you know, before joining Ascenders 11 years ago, uh, my whole life has been spent in the area of uh, doing marketing. And when I, when I joined Ascenders, I realized that my job has suddenly transformed in the sense that here we have an environment where the people who use us or touch us or we touch them calls them the second home. You have to provide a product, a solution, a service for at least eight hours continuously every day. And for those who like work, they can even stay more than eight hours in the office. So the way we build our customer experience is very different from companies that just touch them occasionally, either going to the bank or going to the restaurants and so on. We have to start thinking about customer experience from the courtship days before they even sign up with us, when they are with us, and even if they decide to leave us, we still hope that one day they will come back and become our customers again, maybe not in this country, maybe in another country. So the orientation of how we serve them, we start looking at it a few years back, you know, in three broad areas. One, how do we build our products in such a way that you know, people enjoy being in that, you know, buildings, in that environment and so on. Secondly, the way we deal from billing to property management and so on, how do we meet our service level agreement day in, day out, year in, year out, you know? And the latest things that we are also embarking on, and we are, I think we are the first in the, in, in, the, in the industry, and that is, can we also make our legal documents easier to read? So we are the first ones to get our lawyers to look at plain English uh, tenancy agreement. And interestingly, not many uh, legal firms raise their hand to want to do that job for us. Right? And eventually, uh, now we are rolling it out uh, to our customers, you know, and we are testing it. We are trying to see what is the feedback on using legal terms. It's not easy. Every touch point, everything that we do, we have to think through how would we be able to deliver service. And especially in the context of Singapore, a major change that sparked this change was that uh, we could not find enough people managing our office. We could not find enough people running security. So when we had to move from a building-specific team to a zonal team, how would we change the way we organize ourselves, we serve our customers? And so all those are the key drivers to how we had to change uh, to look at uh, the various technology, mindset of people, internal processes to serve our customers uh, better. Super helpful. I'll, we know, I, I do want to share something if, with yeah. your permission. Uh, when, when we started sketching this, Alp made an entire mind map. I want, it's a free <laughs> giveaway from my side. <laughs> this is the level of detail that's been thought through just to structure this conversation. Alp, thank you so much. No, 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 so I'd love for you to kind of share. Uh, I know you can't see this, but uh, find Alp later. Uh, he's not hard to find, but I'd um, love to share your I'm, thoughts. I'm on very it. bad at memorizing things <laughs> and, and staying on script, so therefore I need to organize my thoughts a little bit. But I'd like to, I'd like to um, take a little bit of a helicopter view. Um, in our Australian operations, having 30, 35% market share, um, you're, you're commanding data of 8, 9 million customers. Mm -hmm. and what you do with that is entirely dependent on your mindset on what is it that I want to bring to the, to the people. Are they only my customers or are they part of my community as, as you have mentioned already. So I think what, where the journey starts is really that the business acknowledges that you're not doing something against or for people, you're doing it together. And when you do that you need to build that around a purpose. Your employees will only be fired up if they know they're serving a purpose. Our purpose is making the world a safer place. Everybody can subscribe to that. And if you then enable the front line to actually come back and have impact on your strategy, this is where the connectedness starts evolving. And when you do that, a culture emerges. A culture emerges of not saying, not my job, or it is another person's responsibility. It is everybody's responsibility. 
And CX, I, I mean, I've been in marketing all my life, and, and I'm coming from originally from the advertising side of it. I think there is so much pollution of, of words and jargon in this. At the end of the day, we're bringing a service, we're bringing an emotion, we're bringing a result, a feeling to the customers. And there is a difference between mere satisfaction and total satisfaction. And that is what we need to be, what we need to be working on. So without a purpose, without your employees rallying around that, how can you bring world-class services to, to the customers? It's impossible. Um, I think the, the, the biggest hurdle is actually for shareholders and for, for, for the board and, and for senior management to acknowledge that you cannot cost cut your way out of, out of um, uh, the, the conundrum. You need to win over the hearts and the minds of the customer. And you can only do that when you're authentic. You cannot just slap a slogan there and say, that's our slogan, you've got to be living it. And that's what, what we have done um, quite successfully, I would say. And we, we did it with, as I said, data driven. We did probably in the industry, we're a little bit late. <coughs> Banks are usually a little bit faster in this way, and consumer goods are always at the forefront of this. We're a little bit late to the game, but what we have done is, uh, uh, for the industry, a groundbreaking research where we overlaid all our customer data of 8 million plus customers with credit card spending and behavioral analytics. What came out of that was that all your demographic you know, segmentation is worthless. Because you have, what we came out with from, from our perspective is that you have 14 distinct persona that go across demographics, that go across educational levels. It's more of a lifestyle grouping. And now we have 16 brands. How do you, how do you match these 16 brands to actually all that customer base? So we decided very consciously to cut that down to four brands that cover clusters of these customers. And then you need to think about a customer can move from one segment to another in his lifetime. And you're looking at customer lifetime value. So you need to make that journey as well. We're not in the luxury of having only one brand that can, that can you know, go with the customer throughout their lifespan. So they will evolve. They will evolve from certain segments like you know, cost conscious and you know, minimum uh, necessary to actually, as their lifestyle progresses, to, to different covers. So I think it's really a, um, a two-pronged approach from the top. Leadership must acknowledge that um, it's not about cost cutting. It's not about productivity. It's really about what is it that I'm adding in value to this person's life that I can actually bind him with? And the answer is invariably in the front lines. And we've got to engage with the front lines. And, and you're doing that with your business. You know, all of you are connected in there. So that's where you bring it all together. So what I want to do now is to drive tangibility to this conversation. We need to come in and start talking numbers, right? To start talking metrics. So on the fundamental bedrock of culture and a belief that this needs to be done, I want us to really dive deep, uh, dive deep into two things. Um, one is the metrics that you start, started holding as your North Star, as you started these programs. And how did you use them to get buy-in across the organization? Because we've identified that senior leadership buy-in, very important, frontline uh, to work towards it is very important, culture is important, but now how do you get the buy-in? Because even in, a, in an environment with great culture, unfortunately, if you don't have KPIs and metrics around it, it's very hard in a large organization for you to come in every day and do something that you're not kind of adjudicated or judged against, right? So I'd love for you to start, uh, and I think you can maybe start with Raju, really around getting the organizational buy-in and what KPS, how did you look at the ROI of CX when the program started itself? So when we uh, started, and I, I think you mentioned a word, culture. So I think our underpinning, uh, and we've all been talking about the fact that getting, it's all about your people. Uh, and people thinking aligned and not a, a CX team and your leadership aligned. So I think a big focus was around defining different forms of adoption metrics. Right? So we, we shied away and purposely from initially linking them to kind of direct business outcome metrics. Uh, because then uh, people who were doing things their way and was getting results. So all these people are getting results. It's difficult to tell them that you know you will get better results. And if we did not, so initially we did not want to clash metrics with metrics they were already using for their own success. We wanted to believe that you know what will you adopt so that it becomes culture. And so we went in a lot of metrics that allowed people to say participation, adoption of this way of uh, of operating. 
And the way we enabled it, and that is where senior leadership comes in, even in our group scorecards, we had these adoption metrics etched into the group scorecards. So which normally only had these kind of outcome metrics, we made these adoption metrics part. So if our CEO had that metric, it was obvious, and he had to explain it to his board, all his one downs had to have that metric. And from all his one downs had to have the metric, everyone else had to have the metric. So that was key, and he adopted those metrics at his level, and he convinced the board that those are metrics necessary to change the culture of the organization. And that was an important thing for a bank to do it, and I think that was our biggest success factor, getting metrics that take, took away. So some <laughs> metrics like that, then we had initially metrics, something that was very customer-centric. We created a metric, a lot of you know, called customer hours which was instead of treating as, you know, what is the uh, internal FTE reduction, or uh, we, we just said that, and we had si uh, silos like any big organization, right? So people would say that, you know, I have an SLA with you. I, you give it to me, I will give it back to you in 24 hours. So we said, you know, we don't want to get into those kind of turf wars. So we said, doesn't matter if uh, we know this, the customer, the day he thinks he needs a card, his clock starts, and the day he comes back, the card comes back to him, even if it goes through Sync Post, whoever, it doesn't matter. He will say, I requested from DBS. And we created the thing called end-to-end -end customer hours, and we made internal uh, goals around that customer hours. So people, when they came together, they were always, that metric became the metric to reduce and not uh, fight over internal SLAs. So we, we, that, those kind of metrics helped us in our initial days of adoption of making people move away from their silo anchored metric to an outside in metric like customer hours to adoption metrics at the group scorecard level for the senior leaders and their institutions which uh, drove and um, different things we, we mandated the coos of every country to become asian service implementation managers so those people were the became mandated champions by the ceo so you know it became part of their job mandate. So a lot of these things became that helped to embed the culture into the organization. Super helpful. Vipul, I know your deliveries don't happen through SingPost, so <laughs> it's a very, very tight timeline. I'd love for you to kind of educate us on such a real-time business. What were the metrics that you started aligning and what are the metrics you look at uh, uh, even before we come to the yeah, Absolutely. So traditionally in this industry, as you know, anything to do with food experience, it's not uh, surprising to expect that the two key drivers of choice would be taste and speed. But the insight we stumbled upon a couple of years ago was given how life is happening and transforming and changing for consumers across the world, consumers value ease more than they value complexity. Consumers value the insight of the entire experience becoming easier because life is so complex. And so to taste and speed, we added ease as a metric. And so if you look at the entire uh, f format of pre-order, order, post-order, post or acquisition, conversion, retention, any which way that you look at it, we are trying to make the acquisition experience easy because food is habitual. We're trying to make the conversion experience fast because the insight is I want it when I want it. And we're trying to obviously make the uh, retention experience all about taste. And we like to keep it very, very simple because, uh, you know, my, my, my own acid test is I'm not a customer guy, but if I can understand it, then hopefully the rest of the guys can too. But keep it as simple as we can. So we, the entire metrics are driven around, are we doing something to make it easier, faster, tastier? And that's what we measure every day, every shift, every transaction, every time. That's what comes up to my table when I look at it every week or every month. And so strong focus on metrics that impact the customer as opposed to you know, KPIs, which may be business outcome driven, which is really for you. So Alvin, Alp, your thoughts really on the metrics that matter? Um, for us, uh, three years, so we, we have been running annual customer satisfaction survey for the last 10 years up to 2015. And when the company merged, uh, we had a new board. And I pulled a fast one on the board by removing uh, the indicator. Uh, we, we always had 5% of our corporate KRA uh, allocated to customer experience. Right? And 2015, I removed it. Um, for, the for the last two years, the board has been hounding me. When am I going to put it back? <laughs> right? And that shows how serious my board is about 
the customer experience. Why I pull it out is because we needed a rethink. How are we going to use the right metrics to um, have a yardstick uh, measurement on how we are performing? So from an annual decision maker survey, we split it into three parts. We are still doing the annual decision maker surveys, but the survey goes out to really, we clean out the database, those of people whom we think are decision makers and influencers. And then we created another survey called the user survey. We were also trying to see if we can move from a B2B relationship to a B2B to C relationship, and therefore, whoever touches our properties, we want to know how they feel about our, about, you know, their, their experience with us. And annually, we do this. Users are we're going to expand it further to make it more real time. And then, uh, when we sit down, the CEOs of the countries are all there with us, and we go through, and then we shortlist a few areas that we want to work on. And then that's where the transaction survey kicks in to monitor how we are achieving what we set out to achieve. One caution I'd like to give you also when you implement this is that the attitude you take towards these numbers. We were very fortunate that my management today don't see the scores as a competition. So for example, Singapore we score 56, India we score 80. So is 80 better than 56? We should not be doing that. The second attitude which is very important is that a few years before this survey was done, we implemented also uh, survey systems for our PMB services, where we were channeling everything through a call center. We got interesting scores. But along the way, we decided to make it become punitive, to say, hey, why aren't we meeting SLA and, and so on? And it really backfired on us, because what happened was that our staff would not want to register all these complaints on the system. Right? So the base suddenly came down, right? And the scores were very good. So, so we, we changed that mindset and then that taught us a lesson. So whatever KRAs you use, especially for customer experience, use it positively. Don't use it as a punitive, you know, a slap on the wrist kind of indicators to make sure you chase the numbers. It is not going to happen that way. So, Two key messages here. One, how do you get the top level buy-in and make it a strategic initiative for the company is very important. Secondly, as what Alp says, getting your staff to deliver the service, how do you make sure that the indicators become a tool for them to encourage them, to align them with a the purpose that we want to achieve and not as simply a number that we want to achieve? Uh well, I think numbers are only as good as the people who are reading them yeah. and, and the insights that they're taking from it. It's like, as they say, right, don't ever trust the statistic that you haven't faked yourself. Yeah. And what I would, we have metrics over and over. We, we, reporting decks are 300 pages and, and you have the data, you have metrics. I think the, the true question about it, I mean, we started with MPS, we, we, we expanded that into other um, customer metrics as well, and MPS is in our balance scorecard as a group, we have 20% MPS related, employee MPS and, and customer MPS, so it is, it is significant. Uh, the other one being risk and, and uh, financial outcomes. So I think overall it's really more about the curiosity to look at the data and say, what can I extract out of this? What does it tell me about the customer behavior? We have, in, in some countries, enormous res resistance when the uh, strategic NPS numbers are coming out, for example. Um, they say, well, I don't believe the numbers. It's, it, it's not right. It can't be right. So I think, and, and, and this bias, this innate bias is coming out of a, a cultural approach to, to having been invested in the way you do business. And, and we are very traditional industry obviously. So for me as a newcomer three, four years ago when I, when I started, it was mind-boggling to see how people were not trusting data that was coming through with insights that they were generating out of this. And I think this is um, 
the ego that comes into play of senior leaders sometimes to just not look at it and say trust the numbers and say well experiment with that. Everybody like to, likes to be seen as, a, as an analytical leader and someone who you know is logical but when it comes to executing on the data and changing the processes that's when everybody gets a little bit more anxious about how to do that, shall we do it or not and, and is it guaranteed. My question and answer then is always have you calculated the cost of inaction? Have you calculated how much you're leaving on the table if you did not act on these things? And there's, I mean, you can, you can, you can spend a lifetime talking about how you drill into data and, and how you analyze it. But let's take an example, for example. People know, people know that detractors, if they are being dealt with, turn into staunch promoters. Yet, people are trying to still get the middle, the neutral, guys to push over to become promoters. These guys will always be there. These guys will always be there. What you need to be looking at is actually how can I make advocates of these guys because I'm being heard. And ultimately all these customer metrics are about behavior, they're about neuroscience, they're about psychology. It's all about how, think about how you're acting when you're interacting with the, with the brand. Think about what you feel when you pay for some service or for some brand and what that experience is that you're taking. And that's what we need to be building our metrics around, number one. Number two, there has to be a correlation that, you'll be, that, that you need to work out for your own industry and for your own business. There has to be a correlation between the customer satisfaction scores or the MPS or whatever metrics you have to the financial outcome of it. Because if you don't have that, you're swimming in the dark and you don't know where the shore is. So you need to nail that one and you need to experiment with that one. You need to say what is an uplift potential that I have here or what is the change of that delivery? What is that going to have as an impact on my return on equity, return on investment, whatever factor you have? And finally, I think um, with metrics and the link to the, to the financials, you have to, you have to see data as an asset. We are talking about it, but we don't have it in our balance sheets. I think it's, it's just a matter of time where you will attach a value to data as data equity because that's your pool of value that sits there untapped. And I'm sure the bankers will be very, um, will be very creative about thinking ways how to get that on your balance sheet. <laughs> yeah, I'll be talking a bit about it later. On, mm. But data is true, but you know, data is a very disturbing area now. So, <laughs> so whose data and who owns it and whose asset is it is a question. I want well, to come to, uh, sorry, no, I'll please. Yeah. We might digress on that one for a second because I think, I, have, I don't have an answer to that, but I would like to really um, pick on everybody's brains here. Um, if we are talking about automa uh, automation and we're talking about the whole new digital world and, and, and what it does to create efficiencies of scale and, and processes, Nobody has an answer to what happens actually to the people that I make redundant. So we're hoping that the new economy is creating the jobs, but what, is a, what about the quality of these jobs? And what about the value that that brings back into the economy? Because I need consumers at the end of the day, that makes the world go around. So I, I don't see any other solution than actually going down the line that people will have equitable assets in data. So I am a consumer and I have a lifetime spending value of I don't know, $500,000 in consumer goods, and that is my value. So now I need to think about what is the structure that I can bid that out to and earn a living out of that. I think these are the but things that we the, need the to look at. The difference for me is the access to data was is the right to use the data. So we have all getting more and more access to data. Do we have the right from the consumer to use it in, is the fine line. Awesome. That's a larger discussion <laughs> for another panel. Okay. All right. So I actually want to come down to the question we've all been waiting for. Uh, and that comes down to we're getting some phenomenal questions. And someone said, how do I get the dollars for my CX program? The, there was a longer question, but really it came down to how do I go and ask for money in an organization where either someone of your role and title doesn't exist or that the budgetary layout doesn't exist. So I would love for you to you know, dive in in any order. It's perfectly fine. Uh, the ROI you have seen from CX for those who really don't care about the, the process, right? If you have to say, this is what I hope to tangibly achieve, this is what these organizations did, and I know we discussed some incredibly tangible and uh, down to the bone, uh, you know, hardcore numbers. So in no particular order, I would love for you to educate us all on the ROI of CX. Why is it that all of us are in this room? 
What's Let me start. I know we're coming close to noon and probably people are hungry, so I'll start with pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> How hard can it be to sell pizza after all? It's, it's simple, it's easy. And uh, the correlation that we have seen is, uh, as I talked about earlier, between speed and taste, because I have yet to meet a hot pizza I have not liked. Uh, and so one of the things we do track is the uh, speed with which the pizza order is received, because from the time we get the order, we take, make, bake, cut, pack. Uh, then we put it onto a delivery system and it reaches you wherever you are. And we now track it, et cetera, et cetera. But that entire process of taste and speed being correlated and that being correlated to heat is something that, so the pizza should arrive at your table at a certain level of temperature. Let's call that temperature X. And we know that for every minute of delay, the temperature goes down by Y and the customer overall satisfaction goes up or down by Z. And we track that. So there is a very tangible correlation in the customer metrics in the two key drivers of choice, which is taste and speed, even before ease. And that's something we track maniacally. I've talked about ease and simplicity. We run a very large organization across the world. You know, we open, as I said, 2,000 new restaurants every year. So a new restaurant every four hours. Each restaurant employs 40 to 60 new people. The ability to simplify the training process so that right down from where anyone is sitting in the office to somebody sitting in a restaurant store, tracking his or her balance scorecard focused on taste, speed, and ease is the kind of simplicity we like to drive through our system to get the consistency of the experience, and that impacts the overall business and the customer experience. So, uh, so on the question of ROI, we have been journey and we are still, we don't have a perfectly worked, worked out equation. But what we have uh, figured is that our businesses, our customers are, uh, live their lives. They have jobs to be done and we using our products and services are trying to get admit, uh, embedded in their lives through our journeys. And so we as any business, we have things which we want to acquire better. We want to, so our so adoption must go up, cost of acquisition must come down, cost of transacting must go down. So I, they, as they engage with us, there is cost of uh, clarifying, servicing, fulfilling the uh, request. So this is where all, uh, and then the cost of engaging, right? So engagement, uh, things, all of these are cost or point drivers which finally affect your cost income ratio, right? So whether it's income or cost. So, and all these costs fall off from how you have designed your journey and your delivery processes to support that journey. And that is how we are linking up. To link up to see that, look, looking at all the journeys, how are you impacting your acquisition, whether it's from the adoption side or the cost side, the fulfillment from a cost of transaction side or your various engagement so that he is actually, you have costs of keeping your customers engaged and how that is happening and are you getting the level of engagements you want. And these all don't just happen, they have to be curated by your organization. And, uh, and that is how you see whether that curated experience is delivering you those business outcomes. Uh, for me, I think I just wanted to just step back a little bit, just in case you didn't uh, appreciate the, 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 what I'm trying to say earlier on is that for us, we, when we run the customer experience, it's not just to our tenants. We also run the customer experience to the governments. Right? Why? Because in our business, uh, the customer experience defined for the government allow us to get land, which is the fuel for our business hopefully at the preferential rate so that we can build our business on or be able to work with us to change the environment so that we can serve our customers better. So we have a customer experience program where we deal with the governments to give us a preferential raw materials. And then we have the customer experience program targeted at our tenants and hopefully they will stay with us and grow with us. So those are the two aspects of how we run the, the program. And thus far, I would say we measure our success from the fact that we never had any issues with governments looking us up, offering us sites.
to work with them on for the last 20 over years. For our customers in many of these cities, um, uh, we actually uh, get a premium uh, versus our, our competition. You know? And some cities where we are uh, competing, we get better quality customers you know, on a like for like basis. Because customer experience to us is really important because the buildings that we build, any other developers can do the same. But how do we stitch it together? How do we serve our customers? And how do we create value for our customers? Those are the things that will differentiate us uh, in the future. Awesome. Uh um, I'll probably just take a real life example out of our business in, um, in India. Um, our NPS results showed that in the verbatims that there are a number of irritants. So we created the um, Listen, Learn, Act um, initiative and in our call center we have walls where everyone is free to pin and after any interaction what they see as an irritant or how to resolve an irritant. That goes then back into our design teams and they are looking at how to make the journey frictionless and, and, and free. And in this case, we had irritants that were creeping up in, in our claims, we had irritants claiming up in the renewals process, and for the renewals process, we are, we are, we are inching towards a billion dollar revenue uh, per year, and we have a 65% um, retention rate. Um, so the question is, why only 65%? Why not more? And what's the impact of that? So let's round the numbers. If it's a billion dollars and you get a 4% increase on that one, it's a $40 million that's sitting on the table and <coughs> it's just waiting for you to actually activate it. And if you look at it that way, it's, it's very easy to, to create value vectors. And these value vectors are any transaction that's happening in your organization has a monetary value. And it has a satisfaction value for the customer. So you need to filter it and say, okay, good, how does it help to make the experience better? Is the customer better off with this process or worse off? Or is it just an internal issue that we need to resolve and how can we streamline those things? If you start looking at that with, with that kind of analytical mind and if you're, if you're putting on, on, a, on a whiteboard all your value vectors, it becomes pretty self-evident what the next steps are. It, it, it gets out of a philosophical discussion, it gets into a real hard cooperations discussion. So there's one question that came that got answered without me asking the question. The point was around how do you uh, align non-CX people to take on CX KPIs? And the answer to that, what I'm learning, and I just, I'd really like to amplify, is not to give them CX KPIs. NPS is not a logistic supply chain manager's job, right? But when you look at lower cost of acquisition, speedier delivery, better repurchase rate, higher premiums on property, higher renewal rates, those are KPIs that are owned by other people in the organization. And, and Raju talks beautifully about shared glory. And every time the CX team is able to use NPS or any number, it doesn't matter what the metric is, as a driver of that KPI which is owned by non-CX people, CX teams embed themselves into the success of other teams. And I, I did not hear even once any of you say that movement of NPS or any score was the business outcome. That is not a business outcome. So the question that was asked, the answer really is that not to take our CX KPIs and get non-CX people to try and follow them. It's to find a very strong correlation and preferably causation between movement of CX metrics and the business outcomes that other teams run on. We should have both. So we, you must have perception, descriptive okay. metrics, and and these outcomes which we talk about, right? Mm. So I, I think it's, it's but you, they will only act if their outcome metrics are aligned. And for us, we think the, the journey thinking is where we are saying is finally you are responsible mm. for the, uh, the journey. Your business outcome comes out of your customer going through the journey you have, you want them to go through as a business leader. Uh, so if you believe that, then you see that uh, he has the experience he is getting and he's, yeah. Yeah. feeling good about it. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to add something to that. Um, it is, we always say it's not a function, but how do you actually translate that into throughout your business that people think from the customer's perspective? And I can give you an example. Um, our risk officers in any of our businesses are, are adamant about um, you know, making sure that business risk is, is managed properly and to the detriment sometimes of the customer satisfaction and customer experience, obviously. So I think you can go at, at loggerheads with that and say, well, I need this for my customer to be, customer experience to be great. 
and he will say, but we can't do that, it's too risky, or we have, we have something standing against it. When we talk about culture shift, it's really just the question of, all right, you're the boss, you tell me, what do I need to do so that you as the chief risk officer or the responsible person for ABC function, doesn't matter, what do I need to do to make you comfortable with what we're trying to achieve? What would mitigate your risk? And that, I think if you start that dialogue, you bring them in and, and they get invested in actually serving the customer more. All the while not giving up on their territory and on their, on their area of expertise where they say, look, I need to have this covered. And it starts a dialogue and you say, okay, good, let me see what we can do. And if you do that, it creates a better atmosphere where, where the culture actually can be influenced. So we can uh, go on with this forever, Vipul, maybe a closing One question. last comment on this, and that I think is in the simplification of our metrics. In our business, we believe the guy who, or the girl who runs the restaurant is the leader of our business. And the restaurant general manager, as we call that person, and we have 47,000 such restaurants, has five key metrics. Those are exactly the five metrics that are on my goal sheet and my bonus factor. All the members of my leadership team have the same five metrics. So for example, if you say taste and speed as a metric, even my head of HR has the same metric. It really focuses the organization on what's important. And, uh, and it also tells us the many things that we will not do. Because you know, the sense of strategy is making choices. I thought I'd leave that with you, that thought with you. I think, just, just one comment, if all else doesn't work, just rotate the people around. <laughs> <laughs> put the service people to go and run operations and vice versa, and I think they will have a totally new perspective. Correct. And we have done that in the organizations to deal with some of these uh, very difficult to manage situations. So part of experience is delivering on promise. We told them we'll be here for 40 minutes. We've been here for 45 minutes and 52 seconds. So we can do this forever, but unfortunately, we've been flagged off for <laughs> exceeding our brief in terms of time. Uh, thank you so much for the questions you sent. I know we could not take all of them. Please feel free to come up and talk to them, post this. This is not a one-time conversation. Thank you all of you for taking thank so you. much time for this, and thank you for being a wonderful audience. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, Mr. Vinod Mutukrishnan. Mr. Vipu Chawla, Mr. Raju Nai, Mr. Alvin Tan and Alp Altun. Thank you. <laughs>